Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I hope that we find you doing well this morning. And those who have been sick, we hope that your recovery is going well. And we just thank God for things being as well as they are. And we first want to give a shout out to all of our fathers this morning. Happy Father's Day. We know that traditionally we would be in church or we'd be getting ready to go out and celebrate the fathers in your life. I'm so thankful to God for the father that he allowed me to have. That's a shout out to Big Charles resting in peace. And we thank God for him and to all of you fathers out there. It's not an easy job to be a good father. Anybody can be a daddy, but to be a good father is not an easy job. But, but glory to God for all of those um, who have been good fathers in their children's lives. And we thank God for you. And we do have a word today. God sent a, uh, a strong word today. And it's designed to not just touch on fathers, but to touch on us as a people, as a black, as a black people. And I know that it is... Um, it is in my heart now to speak more about these issues that have come out. And, and somehow you get a boldness to, you know, you don't worry about your job. You don't worry about how people are going to look at you. Right is right. And you have to make a stand sooner or later. But before we go into that word, please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Father, we come in the name of Jesus thanking you for being so good to us. Thanking you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for looking beyond all of our faults and seeing our needs. Now, Father, we pray that you be with us today as we deliver the word that you've placed in our heart and show that it's applicable to us today as a people. And we pray that your strength will continue to guide us and lead us. And Father, you will bring us through this. And we know that all things will work together for good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose. These and other blessings we ask in our son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The word today <clears throat> comes from the book of Exodus in that 33rd chapter, the book of Exodus and the 33rd chapter. And only a few verses that God had given me um, to read and to meditate on and to discuss with you today. And I want to... Um, I don't want to go too long, but it's it's um, very prevalent that I I discuss this with you. This is this is my my task and my um, my job to do this. And I, I I'm, I, I'm like Paul, brother, and I will not have you ignorant. Amen. Amen. The thirty third chapter of Exodus, beginning at that twelfth verse. And it reads, and Moses said unto the Lord, see, thou sayest unto me, bring up this people and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou had said, I know thee by name and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Thirteenth verse says, now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. 14th verse, and it's our key verse for today. And God said, my presence will go with thee and I will give thee rest. Amen. And we'd like to speak to you from a, a thought today. God is with us in the struggle. God is with us in the struggle. God is with us in the struggle. That's that's good news right there. I could I could I could stop right there, but but he's given me some more to to tell to let you know that that he's with us in the struggle. He's given us some reassurances to let us know that he's with us in the struggle. And this we read the book of Exodus, we give you a little history um, 
about the book of Exodus, we know that it is it is written by Moses and it chronicles the events that led to the delivering of the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we know that they had come into Egypt when Joseph sent his brothers back to bring his father and the rest of his family into Egypt because there was a famine in Canaan. And when Jacob brought the rest of the family into Egypt, the family began to multiply. They came in with 75, 76 people and it began to multiply. And Joseph had died and the Pharaoh who gave Jacob the okay or Joseph the okay to come in, he did not know Joseph and he did not remember the covenant that the Pharaoh made with Joseph. So as Israel began to multiply, he became, he, he, became afraid and felt that these people are multiplying at an alarming rate. And if we don't do something to subdue them or cause them to submit to us, they will take over us. So what they began to do, they raised up taskmasters and they enslaved the children of Israel. And for some 400 years, over 400 years, they would cry out to the God that Joseph believed in and the God of Jacob that he would deliver us. And God had promised Jacob that they would be, his people would be in captivity for 400 years, but he would come and deliver them. And now when they are in captivity, they are crying out to the Lord. God raises up Moses. And we know the story of Moses, how he was, he was born to Yoshebed and, and her husband, and they were Hebrews, and they were Hebrew slaves. And, and at the time, there was a decree from the Pharaoh that all male children were being killed. But Yoshebed did not want her child to be killed. For, so for three months, she, she, she raised him. She kept him. And when she could not keep him any longer, she sent him down the river and in a little basket. And Pharaoh's daughter found him and, and raised him in the house of Pharaoh. It was Moses, which means found in the river or brought up out of the river. And, and she raised him in the house of Pharaoh and Moses knew of his Hebrew descent. So don't believe in the, the movies that you see on television with, with Charlton Heston and, and Yul Brenner that he all of a sudden one day found out, no, he, he knew he was a Hebrew and he went out one day and saw an Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew brothers and he, he killed him. And when it became known, he fled into the wilderness. He was 40 years, he was 40 years old when he did this and stayed in the wilderness 40 years. And then God called him, God called him while he was watching over the sheep of Jethro. And he saw on the backside of the mountain, he saw a bush burning but it was not being consumed. Moses went there. And when he went up there, God told him, stop right there where you are and take off your shoes because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. God then told Moses, go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I've heard their cry and I've seen their tears and, and it's time for them to be delivered. I want to keep my promise that I promised my servant Jacob. And now Moses is saying, Lord, who's going to go with me? How can I do this? And God said, I will be with thee. Moses said, who shall I say sent me when they ask? And God said, tell them I am that I am has sent thee. And Moses took this journey and he went in and then God said, Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened. And after nine plagues, he's not going to let you go. His mind is still going to be changed. But on the 10th plague, and that was the, the plague of the death angel coming through Egypt. And God told Moses to tell the servants to get to kill the blood of the lamb and, and spread it over the lintel or the doorpost and Whenever the angel of death would come through and when he would see the blood covering the house, he would pass over. And that's the that's the initiation or the institutionalizing of the Passover celebration, celebrating the night that Israel was set free out of Egypt. And now they're in the, the wilderness wandering because they were they refused to go into the land of Canaan as God had told them because they saw giants in the land. Now they've been wandering for a while. Moses is still communing with God. 
but Moses is now struggling with not only enemies from the outside, but enemies from the inside, because not only were there people from the outside treating, trying to mistreat them and do them wrong, there were also people on the inside acting a fool. So I see why God sent me here today to discuss with you the things that are going on in this world. Israel was so, so similar to black folks today, so similar in their struggle. When God was talking to Moses and Moses was asking, Lord, who's going to go with me? Who's going to help me in this struggle? Remember, they've already been delivered. Now, in this 33rd chapter of Exodus, they are out there in the wilderness and the people are acting a fool among themselves. And he said, now, God, who's going to help me? <clears throat> who's going to help me in this struggle? And then God gave Moses two promises. The first promise that God gave Moses, he said that my presence shall go with thee. That's the first promise. The second promise that God gave Moses is that I will give thee rest. See, this is the time when <clears throat> Moses asked God, he said, you know, he was up there on the mountain. He said, oh, God, OK, God, we're getting to know each other. Show me your face. And God said, no, I can't show you my face because no man can look upon my face and live. He said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'm going to put you in the, play, in the cliff of a rock. And he said, I'm going to pass by. I'm going to put my hand over your eyes and I'm going to pass by. And when I pass by you, I'll show you my hind parts. And when God showed him his back parts, the Bible says that Moses' face began to shine. It shone. It was, it was, it was, it was fluorescent. It shone. And, and when he came down from the mountain and he had the, the, the Ten Commandments, when he came down from the mountain, the people saw him and they were afraid. And Moses had to veil his face because they weren't listening to his words, but they were looking at the illumination of his skin. So he had to veil his face and he would take the veil off only when he went back to commune with God again. So that lets us know that once you've been in contact and communion with God, folks are going to see God on you. So black people, black people, we, we have been in this country of America for 400 years. We've been in this country for over 400 years. We came to this country. The first slaves came to this country in August of 1619, and we're still here today in 2020. And if my math serves me correctly, in August of 2020, we will have been here in this country for 401 years. We've been in systemic bondage for that long. And it's so, so synonymous, so similar to the children of Israel being in bondage for over 400 years. And, and I'm so glad that we serve the same God that they serve. Changes have come down through the years, and, and but we as a people are still not afforded the privilege to be considered totally free. We're still looked upon as being only two-thirds, <laughs> only two-thirds human. Or, or I know some states pass laws that if you are one-eighth black, which means that if you have some black blood running in you, that means you're still considered black and and how society is today. If we look at the origin of man, the origin of man came from Africa. So theoretically, everybody got some black blood in them somewhere. Amen. <laughs> Amen. See, But we still suffer even all these years with all the things that have happened. We still suffer from inequalities. We still suffer from tyrannical injustices. We still suffer from systemic racism that shouldn't be in this country in 2020. We just celebrated June 10th and, and uh, Juneteenth. And with Juneteenth, that's June 19th. With Juneteenth, half I said that half of our folks still don't know what it is. Let me give you a brief history on Juneteenth if you heard about it and not know what it is, just to enlighten you. I don't want you to be ignorant. As Paul said, I will not have you ignorant, my brothers and my sisters. June, Juneteenth is, is when black people were totally set free. Let me give let me go back a little bit. In January 1st of, of, of 1863, 
Abraham Lincoln, who was the president at the time, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which abolished slavery in all states. But we knew that we were involved in a civil war where you have the Union or the Northern states and the Confederacy, which were the Southern states. The Confederacy was fighting to maintain that Southern way of life, to maintain slavery. So black folks could be ruled and, and they would be submissive to the, the taskmasters to get out there and grow that tobacco and to grow that cotton and to serve them as a subhuman, as subhumans, somebody less than humans. But Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, that supposedly or was designed to abolish slavery. But the Southern states said that we will not let our slaves go. So the Civil War continued to fight, continued to go on where Union army still went into various states and then some states still maintained that slavery way of life until the union soldiers came in and it was not until june 19th 1865 that general gordon um gordon granger came into gavinson texas and saw that there were slaves all over the place. And he made the declaration that slaves had been set free and slavery has been abolished. And Texas, in Texas, that was the first state that, ce that celebrated, the blacks in that state celebrated June 19th, um, commonly known now as Juneteenth as the Independence Day for all slavery. And when these slaves knew that they were free, they went all over the country to various places and they took that celebration, they took that word with them. And now we celebrate it all over the United States as a group, as black people, we celebrate this now. And this date is known as the Black Man's Independence Day. This is Juneteenth. Now you've been enlightened to know that June 19th is our Independence Day, but we're still not totally free. We still had to deal with with this gruntle white folks who who believed that we were still less than human. We deal with th we dealt with things such as the KKK and still dealing with it today. We dealt with lynchings and we have we have legal lynchings now. We deal with brutal murders. We dealt with in treatment. We dealt with segregation. We dealt with Jim Crow laws. We dealt with slave patrols and even today with police brutality and discrimination and poverty and and yes, even genocide, which means that we have struggles within our own race which is sad. We have struggles within our own race. But God said that he's seen the struggle and that he's heard the prayers of our foreparents and he's heard the prayers of our grandparents and he's heard the, pair, the prayers of our parents and he's hearing our prayer today. And those same promises that he gave Moses back on Sinai are the same promises that he's giving us today. And that first promise that he made Moses, God has told me to tell you today that my presence shall be with you. Now watch this. This means that God does not expect us to sit quietly and idly by waiting for him to move. We got to do our part. Mm -hmm. That's right. We got to do our part. We have to let the enemy know that we recognize his tricks and God himself is exposing him through the media, through video cameras, through uncovered conversations, etc. God is bringing to light and we have to call it out without fear. God is bringing it to light and letting us know that we're not free, letting us know that we are being mistreated and we have to call it out and we have to call it out without fear, without being afraid. And why shouldn't we be afraid? Because God has promised that my presence will go with you. If we decide to go, God say, I'll be with you. And if God be for us, <laughs> Who can be against us? If God be for us, that's what Mo, that's what Paul says in Romans eight and thirty one, seeing that uh, that we have all these things that are going on, knowing all of this. If God be for us. Who can be against us? If the presence of God is with us, that's more than any army. That's more than any majority. As long as we have God on our side. 
We have to keep on marching. We have to keep on protesting and we have to keep on speaking out and we have to trust him to change the hearts of this system in which we are involved in. My black brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, we, we might have come a long way, but we haven't arrived yet. We might even sit at the table, but we're not eating the same food. <laughs> Amen. We might be in the same building. We might be able to go through the same doors, but we are not afforded the same privileges as our, as our white brothers and sisters. We are still, we are still in this struggle from the outside and the inside. So God says we first got to go and his presence will be with us. And we got to be reminded that God's presence is with us. The second promise that God made or God gave us is that he said, I will give you rest. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. Other than just outward struggle, we still have the, the inward struggles as well that we're dealing with. Not only is God promising to give us rest from the enemy outside, but he's also promising to give us rest from the enemy on the inside, the enemy within our own race. Yeah, that's right. We have in, we have enemies within our own race who feel that there's nothing wrong with this system, who feel that we're the cause of going, we're, the, we're our own cause of going through all of this stuff. But I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, it is a system that is causing all of this stuff. And let me share this with you. Everybody of the same kind doesn't have to be the same color. So just because you're black don't mean that you're with us. Mm -hmm. And we hear all the time these folks who are, are making, trying to make white people feel good about themselves by saying it's not your fault, it's our fault. We brought this all on ourselves. So that lets me know that every, everybody of the same kind doesn't have to be of the same color and everybody of the same color doesn't have to be of the same kind because just because you're, you're black like me don't mean that you're with the black movement. <laughs> I wish I had some help out there. And, and we as black people, we have to come together and understand that at the end of the day, despite your title, despite your job, despite your neighborhood, despite your political affiliation, in spite of your, your socioeconomic status, at the end of the day, my brothers and sisters, when they look at you, you are still black. That's right. You are still black. And God has told me to assure you, my brothers and my sisters, that as, a, as he gave rest to the children of Israel from their enemies outside, he's going to give us rest from our enemies inside. He promises to do the same for us. God is not giving a timeline. So don't, I'm not giving you some kind of prophetic word within two weeks or within two years. This is going to take time and it's going to be in God's time. But God has given us a promise and God is not slack of his promises. So whatever God promised is going to come to pass. He knows the struggle. He's seeing the struggle. He's seeing the tears and God is going to bring it to pass. God is not a man that he should lie. God ain't going to go back on his word. If God has told us that if we go, his presence is with us and he's going to give us rest, God is going to give us rest. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm believing God. And I know that one day we'll truly be able to sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, as Martin Luther King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty. We're free at last. And I know that if God's presence is with us, that means that God's spirit is with us. And where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. God bless you, my brothers and my sisters. Don't give up the fight. You keep on speaking out. You keep on protesting. You keep on marching. Whatever God lays on your heart, if you go, his presence is with you. And one day he's going to give you rest. So don't give up the fight. And keep hope alive. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. I told you that I may go a little bit longer today. But but these are some things that need to be said. These are some things that need to be known. Our struggle is real. But one day God is going to bring in fruition the, the vision of freedom that we have. 
and he's going to put down our enemies on the outside and not only our enemies on the inside, on the outside, but he's going to free us from our enemies on the inside. I may not see it, my brother. I may not see it, my brothers and sisters, but one day God is going to bring this to pass. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. We hope we've said something today that would encourage you to go forth and let, let you know that, that this thing is real. The struggle is real. So all that you've seen and heard on television, don't believe these folks saying that it's fake news. No, this stuff is real. And it's been happening for a long time. It's the same kind of racism, just a different face, <laughs> different time and different face. But you hold strong. Treat people like you won't be treated. Just because folks are mean to you don't mean that you're mean to them. You treat folks like they, like you would want to be treated. Love them as Christ loved them, but don't be afraid to tell them, I see your tricks. I see what you're doing and God's not going to stand for it. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Um, we, we ask that you keep us in prayer, keep our sick and our shut in in prayer. And on next Saturday, June 27th, we will, um, my trustee committee will be at the church taking contributions and, and tithe. And we hope that if you are mailing in to keep mailing it in to Mispa Baptist Church, post office box 1275, Baxley, Georgia, 31515. To keep mailing in, the ministry must go on. Um, even in the midst of this pandemic and in the midst of this social unrest, we know that God is still in control. So we hope to um, come back together soon. I, I have no kind of timeline in which we will start. Um, God, is, God is still blessing us. So when God gets ready for us to come back together, God will bring all of us back together um, in fellowship and in union. Amen. So until next time, God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Keep hope alive. I love y'all. I love y'all. I don't know what, what God has for me going forward, but, but I trust God and I believe God. And, um, and it's time. It's, it's time. Amen. That's, we'll just stop with that. It's time. Amen. God bless you. I love y'all. Take care.